And could you please state your uh, full name? Oh, Arthur Gordon Slade. AKA Smiley. That's right. right. <laughs> and what is your age? I was born in 1929, so I'm now 70, 87. And where were you born? Swan River, Manitoba. And I was the eighth child in the family of 11 kids. Wow. And what did your parents do when you were My dad worked for the railway, CN Railway, in Kenville, Manitoba, where we were living. And uh, he bid on a job and got a job in what they call Simon House, which was 10 miles south of Cranberry Portage, Manitoba. At that time, the railway maintenance was all done in 10 foot sections. And they had a foreman looking after each section. So he bid on that job and got it. And he moved up in the spring and we stayed down there till we finished school and came up in, the, in September, October. My mother brought the whole eight kids up. At that time, I was a babe in arms and that was 29. And the, uh, uh, we lived in the section house. That was the only house there other than a bunkhouse. There was nothing else. No roads, and of course nobody had a car anyway, and we used a gas car. But I had a this big family, and we went to every Saturday night dance in Cranberry, which was once a month. <laughs> and the other members of the family often all played something I didn't. But my mother took everybody from the time she could they could walk. I took them all the time anyway, and if we couldn't dance with her, we curled up on the bench and went to sleep in the, in the Elks Club, nice. which is there. So, did, you so ever, uh, did you ever start playing an instrument when you got old enough? Hmm? I was, did I, you ever play an instrument when you got old enough? Oh, no. no? I, I took guitar lessons when I was in university, okay. yeah, or at Falkenberg. <laughs> okay. But I never learned enough to really play anything. But I've been dancing since I was two, and I'm still dancing. I dance as often as three or four times a week. Right and I dance every every Tuesday afternoon at one legion in town, and there's another legion in town has dances every second Wednesday afternoon that I go to. In a dance, in a, also there's the Dance Connection, which is a younger crowd, but all the single dances, and I go as a single because my wife doesn't go to any of those. She's not as much of a dancer. Well, she oh she likes to dance, but. We have live music here, where I live in Red Oak Villa, every Tuesday night. So I danced with her on Tuesday night, but she doesn't like going out to the country dances because her balance isn't good and her legs don't take it, so she doesn't like the crowd. Mm -hmm. So that's one of my main activities now. And as a child, what were your uh, interests or activities? What are my other ones? As a child, do you remember oh, what your oh. interests or activities were? Well, we lived in Simon House till 1937, just the family. So we had to make our own games and play daddy eye over and all kinds of stuff, hide and seek uh, on our own. And then we moved, my dad built a house in Cranberry Portage, which was just almost at the end of his section. So he, we lived in Cranberry, then he went south five or six miles to get on to his, where he had to do the maintenance. And he always carried a gun, because we lived on, well, we lived in the bush. We lived in wild meat, so we had ducks, geese, partridge, okay, rabbits, was, everything. It wasn't, wasn't necessarily for protection, it was more for hunting. That's right, the only thing my wife- supper. My mother and dad uh, bought in town what they had to go in at once a month for their staples like flour and sugar and stuff like that. Everything Other, else you, otherwise, you we lived off the land. Hmm. They had a garden uh, and we had a couple of cows, but there, were, there was not a farm because we were on the edge of the Canadian Shield, right, right at the edge. And that's where we lived. Anyway, in 1937, we moved to Cranberry Portage. And I got up to finish my grade six. While I was in Simon House, I had to get school by correspondence. It came in on the train, the lessons and stuff. And then in uh, 19, 
I graduated, well, I finished grade six, and then he bid on a, the station Flinflon, where they had a high school. So as a result, I was able to go to get my high school. And then I won a scholarship from Hudson Bay Mining and Smelting, which were, uh, were just setting up. So I was one of the third, third people, I think, to get one. And, and, and that paid everything at my university. Nice. So where, where did you go? What, what uh, was your program as well at university? The, my program? I took science with the, I, well, I went one year in the University of Manitoba and they did, I didn't like chemistry and I was good in maths and physics. So I wanted to go into engineering and I wanted to build airports. So I had to move. I tried to go into Queens and, and uh, London and they wouldn't accept me. Queens wouldn't take me because I hadn't taken a, a year of phys ed. So I went to McGill. <laughs> okay. Because it was easiest to get into. But I had no problem with money because I thought everything was paid for at the university, including my residence. And then in addition to the, that pleasure, I was able to come home. My, I had a pass on the railway because my dad was on the sec section for me. So it didn't cost me anything to travel back and forth to Montreal. So I was always able to come home for Christmas and stuff like that. So that was my four years of, finished my fourth year there and graduated in science, specializing in mining engineering. And the first year, oh, we didn't, I didn't have any money, so I didn't stay for the graduation. <laughs> and my, anyway, my first year was that the Ontario Mining Association had set up a program, or maybe it's the Canadian Mining Association, that I would spend four months at each of three mines. So I chose a big gold mine, Wright Argus in Kirkland Lake, Del Knight, which is a small gold mine in Timmins, and I spent four months at each of those. Timmins went on strike before my four months was up, so the manager phoned the manager of Falkenbridge who was Shorty Mott at that time. Too bad you can't interview him. Anyway, he he was a uh, trick over guy. And uh, he says, just send him down. So I got down. There's where I had no money. I got the swastika and I had to get a place to stay. I think I had 25 cents. <laughs> wow. Anyway, so I took the bus into, from swastika into, into uh, Kirshner Lake, which was only about 25 or 30 miles. And the I went straight to the mine and the mine manager, who was Ed Healy at that time, and he said, well, we'll arrange for you to stay at a place. It was a boarding house, Jack's boarding house in Kirshner Lake. And I'll make arrangements that you will pay them when, when you get a paycheck. So I stayed there and worked for four months at Wright Hargreaves. At the end of my situation at Wright Hargreaves, I'm sorry, it wasn't Wright Hargreaves. Falcon. <laughs> That's right, I jumped, I jumped. Because <laughs> then I finished Hargreaves, I went to Del Knight, and then I went to Falcon, okay. which is a base metal, big base metal. And the manager here was Ed. Ed. Yeah. Oh, that, that's very interesting. The production manager here was it was uh, Healy also, he was Ed Healy. And the uh, end of my, f I did every job there was underground that you could do. Worked in the smelter and worked in the mill all for four months. Did you have a, um, a favorite or? Uh, oh, I liked working underground. Underground, yeah? Oh yeah, you always, the next day you could always go and see what you achieved the day before. That's true, definitely working, see the progress. Yeah, working in the smelter, you don't see that or you're the mill. You don't see your results. So that made working underground very interesting. And I, and I tell all the students everywhere I talk that that's what they should do, is go and work underground. A lot of them nowadays, they think they should be a boss right away, and the miners hate it. And uh, so I tell them all, and I, I do a lot of that kind of stuff. I got a couple of scholarships at Laurentian University, which has now a good mining school. 
Anyway, the uh, where did I get to? I got oh, See? when I lived, my four months was up at Falkenbridge. Ed Healy called me into the office and told me, and I hadn't even realized it. He said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I don't know. I never even thought about a job. He said, well, there aren't any jobs. We don't have any jobs for engineers here. I said, well, that suits me just fine. Give me a job as a driller underground and I'll stay. But they had an agreement with their union. They could do that. So I was given a training program for three. So I worked underground for three years. Then I was made safety inspector, and from there on I had 35 other jobs as a boss, as a senior shift boss, mine captain, superintendent, and so on, up to assistant vice president. And I retired in 1984 as the vice president of the Nickel Division for Baltimore. So I had 32 good years with them. And then when I graduated from them, I was living in Toronto, so I promptly moved back to Felt, Sudbury, because it's nice here and I knew everybody. And uh, then I went consulting for 25 years in, in management. Okay. So I set up my own company. I didn't have any employees. I used all the people that were getting laid off from Falkenbridge and Ingle. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, all I had to do was arrange for work in that line. And then, long, I, uh, and then I retired that when I moved into Red Oak Willow when I was about 80-something. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a recurring theme that uh, most people in the uh, mining metallurgy world don't retire very early. <laughs> yeah, no, I didn't. Or if they do, they, they consult. It's not real retirement. That's right. Yeah. But there's a lot of miners retire here. Mm -hmm. They spend their morning drinking coffee. Well, I don't even drink coffee, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same I don't do that. I, I'm a worker. I'm also a professional volunteer. I'll throw you a sheet of paper, it's a full sheet of volunteer work that I've done ever since I moved to, when I was a family. And my mother and dad trained us to say, also trained us to be self-sufficient. So we, and this is exactly the way I've brought up my three kids and my wife agrees with this. And she understood she grew up in the early thirties too. So we had to be careful what we did. So I got three very independent kids, uh, two boys and a girl, Susan, and she took forestry. Oh. And Freddie is a, a chartered accountant. He also won a scholarship based on the Falkenberg Scholarship, <laughs> or the uh, Hudson Bay Scholarship, which we set up at Falkenberg as a result of me getting invited for dinner by a lady who was interested and whose husband had worked at in Finfla. So she asked me all about the scholarship and how it was set up. So Walkenbridge set up two or three scholarships the same way and they're still in action right now. Anyway, Freddie, it's in grade five, he was too smart for the fam, for the class for his, what he was doing at school according to the teacher and they wanted to promote him and this is great one they did promote him up from grade two to three anyway my wife said well that isn't very good and she heard about the scholarship at uh, upper canada college so he won a scholarship at upper canada college just let that off Okay. The teacher said, anyway, so, so where did I end up? So you were talking about the scholarships. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, he pretty won. He was in grade six. He stayed at Upper Canada for four years, grade 10. And then he moved back to Falkenbridge to live, went to Garrison Falkenbridge High School, and he won a Falkenbridge scholarship. That's where we're at. So he went to Guelph and took accounting, and he now runs his own business. And uh, the uh, Bobby went, left home when he was about sixteen. As a young guy, he enjoyed drugs and all that kind of stuff, and he got a job at Falkenbridge for six months and got laid off because we had cutbacks again. 
and he got on his motorcycle and went out west. And I had family members all across the country, so he stopped and visited them all. Went all, right out to Fort McMurray, and uh, they knew a friend there who was from Falkenbridge, and he, but he didn't get work there. He had to come back to Medicine Hat, and he worked as a welder's helper living in Medicine Hat. So he took a course in welding, but he didn't, and he didn't do the the welding for pipelines and stuff like that. Uh, whenever he he was to number one in his class when he were in there, and then he decided, well, I should take a course, and he, so he took motorcycle mechanics, graduated from the top of his class, got his license, and then he loaded everything up to move. So here, he was going to go to Wawa and open up his own business, and I said, well, forget it. Wawa was off the road, off the highway. <laughs> and uh, so I checked here, everybody wanted to hire him, but he said, well, I'm not going to work something for anybody else and give them a good name. He said, so I'll open my own shop, which he did for 10 years. In Sudbury? In Sudbury. Yeah, it's a Rock City, he actually called it. And he, he had people come from Thessalon to get their work done there. And I talked to the guy from Thessalon who was a mechanic and had his business. He said he's the best motorcycle mechanic in Northern Ontario. Anyway, unfortunately, he also had all the, the gang, motorcycle gangs were his best customers. They paid very well. They wanted to work very well. <laughs> and the, the hells. Yeah. So anyway, they got clamped down by the cops here in Sudbury. And uh, so he said, well, I might as well sell my motorcycle business. So what he did, and he went to work for Strata, or not Strata, for uh, uh, one of the construction companies. Anyway. He spent a, a year with a mechanical guy and learned law all about uh, uh, bigger machineries and stuff. And then he worked for Walkenbridge in Keep Creek in Timmins. And he commuted from Sudbury to Kid Creek every week. They paid all his expenses in Timmins and paid for his trip there every time. So he always came home for the weekend. He had his own house. He's a bachelor. Yeah. He, he had a girlfriend he was going to marry, but he kicked her out because she didn't like him racing motorcycles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, he, <laughs> so there's my family. Him alive. <laughs> so that's my family. Okay. And I worked for Falkenbridge for, uh, as I told you, for about 32 years and I did all that retirement stuff. So when I retired, when I retired, I, that's when I went, consul went consulting. And after about 25 years, I decided it was time. So we sold our house, first time we'd ever owned one and uh, used the money and moved into here in the Red Oak Villa where my pension covers everything except the gas for my car. So it's good for my wife and I. So that's my life story. Okay. Uh, if we go in a bit more, uh, more detail, um, can we talk a bit uh, more about your role in Falconbridge? Oh, yeah. You had, uh, so after your uh, three years or so working underground, yeah. Then what position did you... Uh, well, I started out with mine safety. Yep. Shift boss, mine captain. I had a couple of uh, engineering jobs in between. as was just some to the manager and stuff. And then eventually went to Toronto as assistant to the vice president. Then he got moved back to Falkenbridge again. My wife had just... We'd bought a house in Toronto and she'd just hung the grapes. I got moved back eight, eight months later, uh, and then uh, I got moved back to Falcon, to the head office again as an assistant manager. And then I had the plane crash. Yeah, so could you talk a bit about that? There was a plane yeah, crash. so the plane crash, which I explained all, how it was all set up. They were killed, the manager, general manager Sudbury and the vice president were both killed, so I took both their jobs. And they ended up as manager. And then I, as I mentioned, I'd retired after 
what, I don't know how many years I was here. 30, I guess, at Falconbridge. And while you were at Falconbridge, uh, did you see anything um, change dramatically within the company? Whether oh, good or bad? 32, or? 32 years. Yeah, what kind of... 32 uh, jobs. 32 jobs, wow. <laughs> Every job. I never asked for an in a job. I never asked for an increase. My objective when I graduated from university was to be as well like by, be a shift boss, make 10000 a year, and be as well liked by the men as my dad was. Well, I achieved both of those things very early. And then the other objective was to enjoy life. Mm -hmm. So I enjoy people, I enjoy life. So now since I'm retired, all that, I dance. I, there was lots of activities. I got. I'm a, my son told me I'm a professional volunteer. I mean everything. You volunteered for United yeah, Way. Oh yeah, I was chairman of the United Way for three years. When I first moved back here to Sunbury, and then I've been involved in lots of others. And I've been right now. I'm a member of a group that are trying to make Sudbury a better place, and particularly interested in green. Okay. Yeah. Did the uh, environment? Did Falconbridge ever do any work, um, or at least when throughout your career, did you ever see a big change with Falconbridge's um, oh, yeah. policies or practices about? Oh, uh, when I hired under Falconbridge, we drove a drift. We had to use timber for everything. We had timber over the back and so on. Well, while I was at Falconbridge, we started using Shot Creek. I was involved with the with that particular thing. We had a lot of firsts at Falconbridge. We had the shot creek. We started using the uh, screening, and we used. They used to use rock bolts for the when you were slushing muck, if you know what I mean by slushing muck. Well, one of the soap bosses that worked for me said we we should use uh, wall bolts, eye bolts. So we started using eye bolts for that. And then we started using the eye bolts to put the screen on, so we didn't need any timber anymore. So between the shot fruit, shot creek, and the eye bolts and the screening, we eliminated timber. At that point, before that, the timber, all the floors had to be covered with plank, two and a half inches thick and heavy as hell, and you had to hoist them all up the manway up the and lay them out. After we poured, we did cut and fill soaps, and we would we started using uh, tailings from the mill, and we just to, to fill them. We'd raise the raise the mill hole, and then pour fill eight feet of fill in, and cover it with plant. Well, we decided to try and make that concrete, but it wouldn't set. Why not? Well, when you're scraping, it would scrape too. It wasn't hard enough for okay. the scraper. But one weekend at Hardy Mine, which is one of the mines we have, uh, we had a leak in the in the in the rays, and the water pipe leaked all over the floor, and it set hard. And that's how we got. That's how c cement got put into tailings for floors so you needed and eliminated of, all this hardwood. All you just this needed wood. a bit of water. Just a little bit of water. Huh. So so we used to, when we did the filling now, we just sprayed it with water for a week, off and on, and we had hard rock, hardwood concrete. Huh. So that was another little invention we had. I also got the first raised drill for drilling holes when I was the mine captain at uh, East Mine. I, mean, I worked for an old timer who let me run everything and do everything as a mine captain. So I got I arranged to get this raise borer so we were able to bore a hole. That was the first time we'd had one in Falkenberg or maybe anywhere, I don't know. But I also know that we also built, instead of wooden mill holes, we made steel mill holes three sections and they were circular. So they were easy to assemble and, and fill the stove. 
So that's another little invention they did at East Mine while I was there. And the uh, these are all little things that happened while I was there because I was always innovative. And I've always been innovative. But those are some of the things. Okay. Um, maybe if I ask you a few uh, more social questions tying to the job or your career. First being uh, the presence of women. I always ask that because it is more of a male dominated industry. But from the beginning of your career to the end, have you seen, uh, did you see a change or an increase? In oh, women? certainly. And in their positions? Not only that, but I'm an activator. So I'm involved with the university. I, I go to, the, there's a meeting, I think, of women this week or next week, of women that are now taking mining at Burlington University. And I have uh, two scholarships in mining at the university that I've donated to. I donated shares that I had from when I was, I was, well, after I left Falkenberg, I got on the board of directors of Palangio Mines and Callanham Mines. And I owed to those, I got options on shares. So instead of exercising the options and paying taxes, I donated all the all my options to the university for two engineering scholarships and mining, with the requirement they had to work underground. It's the only requirement, and I arranged for two nurses at the when they opened up the medical center. They started the first new medical center in universities in Canada. That well, that's. Uh, Luncheon about 10 years ago. I think their first graduates are just finishing up. So I give money to that, and that is a united way. And I'm involved with uh, the archives here. Each city in Ontario is supposed to have an archives. They didn't have one. Every, all their uh, stuff was stored in the basement of the city hall. So if it rained, they'd have nothing. But, so I arranged, I joined the Archives Committee. I arranged to get the administration building from Falkenberg to be donated by Extrata to, to the city. So we now have a city archives established at the town of Falkenberg. Because it's got quite a history so, in the city. So. So, so I've been active in a lot of things okay. in the community. Um, I'm still there. So you have seen a, you'd say you've seen an increase uh, in women in the natural resource world, and you've helped. Oh yeah, yeah. I took the first women underground at Falkenberg when I was mine super. The the students that taking geology used to come and visit, and the men went underground, and the women had to stay up. They couldn't go underground. There was some superstition that a woman went underground. It was not safe. Yes, there was bad luck. So I went to my boss and I, the manager and I said, look, this is stupid. They should go underground. So he talked to the, the board and so on and said, okay, but you look after it, Slade. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> so I started taking, I took the first women underground at Falkenbridge before Winkle even thought about it. And then I started taking families underground. The wife and the kids that were old enough to go underground would come on a Saturday and I would arrange that they would make a trip with the shift boss over their beat to see how mining was done. So that started more visitors. Yeah. And Inco now eventually started taking people down. And did you, uh, when you first um, started bringing women down, did, did you feel like any of them were met with uh, animosity from the men? Were they? No. No? They were very welcomed? Oh, no, that's right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. In fact, I, I would, I'd be surprised if I was involved when we hired the first ones. See, we get, I would use the first jack leg in an underground operation when they were brought in from uh, Japan or wherever the hell they came from. The Swiss, the Swedish Jack Lake. I was an engineer in training, 
and everybody else used the bar and arm and the big liner. I used I used the jack lady, so I I always got the first jack ladies that came into <laughs> just the mine. <laughs> and eventually we got good ones. They're much better now. Now we have they're all mounted, so we have drill rigs and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. The first drill rigs we had we used at uh, Strascona mine where we set up a mining method using scoop trams, which is the first time we'd they'd come to Canada, and that was a result of me and a mechanic visiting down in the States. Saw the scoop trams, so we hired, bought one, and they were built in North Bay, the Wagner scoop tram. And uh, we got the first one into Sudbury, but Inco got the first one underground because we had left ours on surface to train the people how to use okay. it. And we completely revised the mining method at Strathcona Mine from a cut and fill thing to a room and pillar type with cut and fill. But we could connect four stopes together and operate and muck them out with one scoop room. So it completely changed that operation instead of costing about, well, we were going to produce about. Uh, Three, four thousand a year or something. We can increase the production to twelve thousand, cut the costs, and produce more with the scoop tram and the new mining method, and saved enough money to pay for the capitalization for the Strathcona operation. Oh. Hmm. Do you um, do you believe there's a disconnect between um, the mining world and the rest of the public? Do I? What do I think about it? Yeah. Oh, you, yeah. Or do you believe there's a disconnect? Maybe, maybe no, I don't. Sudbury, but no, I'm act, I'm an activist to reverse that situation. Okay. So I I spend time talking to everybody. Yeah. Well, you had mentioned taking people down in the mines and right. scholarships and the and the girls at the university and talking to them at the university. You know, I'm completely the opposite. Because I think mining is so important to Canada. That's one of the main reasons. And then the other thing, of course, is I thought it was the, one of the best jobs I ever had. It's the most interesting. So I promote it as a, a mining, mining job. And do you think there's still a lot of promotion to be done within Canada? Well, there are a lot of other companies, sure. Yeah. And a lot of people that don't think like I'm thinking. I think that's one of the problems. Some are very staid. One of the worst companies for that was Inco. <laughs> How so? Yeah. Well, they, they didn't bother with people very, very much. They weren't? Okay. When I changed the... I should deal with the change that I made. Go back to when we made the change at Falkenbridge. And the... Uh, I think I got something here I can show you. We did... I'm going to give you this. John Mather, who came to Falkenberg as vice president, was the president of Indusman. And he was very successful and very profitable. And that was why he was moved to the head office of Falkenberg, which was Indusman was a subsidiary. So he went to head office as vice president. And I went there as his assistant. And he was in the process, he came in 1975, I guess. In 1976, he decided we should reorganize. And his organization was underway when we had the plane crash. So I took over with that organization. That's written up in that article. And, uh, and this, Copy this at the star for the new program. I can make you copies or anything you want. Sure. And the uh, but the big thing is we got rid of every assistant. Everybody had to have a job. <laughs> and by doing that, we the only people we laid off was a couple of senior managers and. Uh, Let's see if I can find it. I have a picture here of 
how we changed the organization. We had about 13 layers of management between the Stoke Boss Underground, who was an hourly rated guy, and the uh, president of the company. I had to take over and do that rearrangement. Re this was the result in the organization. Okay. So you see what we got rid of. Yeah, quite a bit. Yeah, well, we made it mo so much more efficient and it's written up in that other article I gave you. Uh, we cut the costs, we improved the morale, and we produced better production, better productivity as a result of those changes that we put in in 1977. And that was the big thing to me in Falkenberg. And it, I was completely responsible for getting that in. So it was a big thing. Yeah, now this uh, this article's interesting too because it, it shows. Oh yeah, the union. The union. Yeah, it shows good relations with the, <laughs> with the union, which <laughs> the, which quite often is not something you uh, you necessarily hear. In the in the 1977, a mining company had the first made the first interview for publicity to the public. Uh, held I held it in Falkenberg with the union. Yeah and the media. It was the first press conference that any mining company I think it ever had. So we give them the roll down. Yeah, for sure. So that was a big thing in my life. Yeah, no kidding. For a fall. Um, you also, uh, completely different, but um, in the 80s I think you uh, you ran for uh, oh, yeah. the federal elections, didn't you? That's right. Yeah, well, and, and See, at that time I was I was ready to retire. Okay. That hadn't do, got nothing to do with the election, but we had a new boss, Bill James. I'm sure you must have interviewed him. I uh, no, I have not. No. Oh, he'll tell you how to run yeah. a business. <laughs> anyway, in my change that I put in, we we had a management philosophy that everybody had to know exactly what their job was. I got rid of all these assistants. I ended up with five managers, one looking after mining, one metallurgy, one accounting, and one in personnel. And uh, that's how we ran the company. So I was situated in Toronto as vice president and general manager of Sudbury. And I had these, originally I think I had six managers, one for engineering, and he got killed in the plane crash. So we just went with five managers. <laughs> and uh, that's how we ran it from then on until I left. And then, and then uh, in 1984, you uh, decided to I did, Well, to run I, Bill James was hired. Okay. Uh, two or three years before that. And he was one of these hands-on guys. He had to make all the decisions himself. I never made any decisions myself. The only I had five managers made their decisions, and if they had a problem, then they came to me. Oh, well, this was not the way Bill James operated. He would come up from Toronto, go to the smelter, and talk to the men, and decide we're going to do this at the smelter, and I was stuck as manager, being responsible for decisions he made, which I never necessarily agreed with. So I concluded when they decided they would cut back in the head office. I helped them cut back. We cut the head office by 50%. And the uh, Bill James wasn't responsible for that. But the, I helped them do that. And I had a, I had a secretary and an assistant. And <laughs> so the secretary went to first pass and then we made another Later of cuts and I got rid of my assistant. He and I sat down and decided that he was older than I was, so he was going to be let go. So I was left there as the only person in the manage in the nickel mining division. And I was vice president of the nickel mining operation, all nickel mining operations in base metal in Canada, and the. Uh, 
Anyway, Bill James didn't agree with my philosophy, so I decided they offered early retirements and the cut back. So I offered to retire because I was 55. And uh, I really didn't enjoy working like that. Okay. That wasn't my way of operation. So I quit because of that. So you, you can't quote that I quit because of Bill James, but that's basically what it was a management philosophy. Different management so. style, yeah. yeah. You definitely do it. But, but he's, uh, he was president of a lot of companies. He saved Falkenbridge when he came in because the first thing he did was they had two chauffeurs on Cadillacs steering uh, Marsh Cooper around. Marsh Cooper was just the opposite. <laughs> he's, I think he's still alive too. You can interview him. But he, he was one of these guys that had to be everything big. So they were worried about it. So uh, Bill cut that? Bill got rid of the last Cadillac on the, the, when he made it. He auctioned it off at Christmas. And uh, this guy who was in charge of metallurgy, who used to come from Falkenburg, and he was a big guy. So he bid on it and he got it for 10,000 bucks or less. Yeah. So that was one, one of the good things he did. He, the other thing he did, he understood enough about mining that you, if you didn't do exploration, you wouldn't have a mine. So he and I agreed on that policy. I ran exploration in Sudbury that cost us about a million dollars while we were in a cutback position. And he didn't even realize that that's what the money was being spent on. Uh, Marsh Cooper didn't know. Yeah. Bill James knew because he agreed with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you had mentioned uh, for um, around the, the time of the elections that um, more politicians should have a, an engineering oh, yeah. or a managing or scientific background. Can you elaborate a bit on that? Well, I, I felt they didn't have enough. Mm -hmm. And so, well, I put my money where my mouth was. <laughs> and you decided to run. Yeah, so I had just retired. They needed a candidate. And I had just retired and moved back to Falkenberg, or to Sudbury. And uh, I said, well, hell, I'll run. And I had the conservatives in Nickelbelt, I ran in Nickelbelt, went from... Uh, 3,500 votes to 14,500 when I ran. I had all the this, all this labor people working on my, with me on the campaign and voting for me. Even the ones that worked at Inco. Oh, yeah. Because they felt I was a good manager and I got along very well with the unions. And the recording secretary for Mine Mill, which was the union at Falkenbridge, seconded my nomination at the Conservative Convention in Nickelbelt. And a lot of these people were never conservatives. Most of them were probably liberals or NDP. Mm -hmm. So I increased all those things. I beat Judy Arrow and Cutter, who was a cabinet minister running for the liberals. As a, can as a candidate, her number of votes dropped from 21,000 to 12,000. Mine went up by 10,000, more than 10,000, but I only got 500 off the NDP. So they got, That's where they, they came up through the middle and John Rodriguez got elected and he was elected a second year too. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you think that nowadays there's uh, there is a better representation of um, the engineering? The I don't know. No, I don't really know. No, because there's nobody that I know that is is in that category. See, okay. Sudbury is all NDP. My son ran in the election in the last federal election oh, yeah? on the same basis as me, and he had a good campaign. 
and a lot of people liked him and so on, but the NDP had more votes. So he didn't get quite enough votes. It often happens in That's uh, right. In fact I go in to towns like this. I go to the office I was in the office yesterday I bought some stuff for this material from one surprise printing stuff and so on. Staples. And the girl said, Boy, your son should have won that election. <laughs> I hear so many positive comments about Freddie, my son. That they want him to probably want him to run again. Well, he he ran he ran a, I think he ran a second time, but he didn't get enough. Mm -hmm. But he had a lot of support. Uh, we'll we'll finish off with um, just a couple questions. One, which is, uh, what are you proudest of in your professional career? What do I want? What are you proudest of in your professional career? The, the most, well, the change that we made at Falkers is the number one item. The one with the, um, the, the restructuring? Restructuring at Falkenberg. Okay. That, well, it completely changed Falkenberg. Mm -hmm. I mean, we improved everything. And that was a result of what John Mather started that I had to finish. So the big thing was reducing the number of people we didn't have any, you only had one staff layoff. All the rest were given early retirements and pensions. Yeah. That'll be Bobby. And that's, um, if you were to speak to someone much younger, like a student, for example, let's take a Laurentian as an example, um, what would be the most important life lesson or piece of advice you would give them looking forward? What is the what? The most important life lesson or piece of advice oh, you well, would give them to go, a student. Okay, go and get practical exercise in any job you're going to take over. And it has to be something you like. Like I, when I returned, I had three objectives, so I've achieved them all. Socially, right now I have a great time. Do all the dancing, all the, the gals think I'm a young thing. <laughs> They don't realize I'm 87. They don't believe it. <laughs> I had one tell me. In fact, they, I was at a session last week where we were promoting women working and uh, trying to make more jobs in Sudbury. And this one girl who is a, a senior person in charge of this place was one of the, they had a panel of four women. And I, I said to her, I said, well, you realize that I'm a senior now, too. And they were talking about seniors that work for them and what they should be doing and, and pleasure, enjoying life. So they asked, mentioned, she mentioned to me and I said to her, well, how old do you think I am? She said, oh, about 70. <laughs> <laughs> and she didn't realize me. So. That's good. That's yeah. good. So. Because of my activities, I stay very active and, look and young. I stay young. For sure. So enjoy life. Enjoy life. Good piece of advice. Well, thank you.